Because we know people who should be successful, but what? They're not successful. Why? So that's his why buy. But what is he afraid of? My personal style of education, but still entertain them, bring them along with stories, right? You can't wait to tell your colleague. You can't wait to go to work and tell somebody. And you're like, oh my God, I can't wait. So what happened? If you haven't seen my TV show, you should get cable. That's what we need to do. From doing a TV show to doing corporate events, I've been so lucky to connect with many passionate entrepreneurs worldwide. What I've learned from a business perspective, because this is the formula for success, no matter who you talk to, attitude will drive your behavior. Would you agree? and your behavior will drive your consequences every single time. Right, we got the concept. Okay, we got the concept. We got, we got the equipment, right? We got the brand, you guys got that. And then again, we got the content that we create. That's the easy part. This is the big one, the big C, which is the commitment. What should you do? That's right, all right. 10 Xers, do not fail me. True test, here it comes. There's skill, and then there's will. Listen to what I'm saying. There is skill, and then there is will. And here's the interesting thing. I know a lot of people who have a lot of skill, but have no what? Will, right? You ever look at somebody who's successful, and you say, why them, why not you? Yes, okay, that's me too. You have more control, but your costs are also gonna be what? Higher. Now, here's where some of the magic is starting to kick in. You can talk to any CEO in the B2B business, any CEO. You walk into his office and they only care about three things. People too. Yeah, he with the suit, put it up. There you go. I hope you can see this. I'll try to draw a big. Let's pretend for a moment that I had seven territories. You remember I wrote that out? Yes or no? Boom, territory two, territory three, all the way to territory number one, seven. So now I've segmented my market. So content is going to start being created by machines. And I'm telling you right now that those people, you guys, the content creators that connect with people are the ones that are going to win. Some people think, well, it won't work for my industry. Really? It'll work for any industry. Trust me. The majority of the time when we're looking to fix something, repair something, or learn something, where do we go? YouTube. We don't even want to read anymore. We go to YouTube. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. When you're doing your thing, beautiful things begin to happen. It's like the law of attraction kicks in. You know what I mean? It's almost like you're in line with the universe. Everything works. And when you do your thing, everybody gets an automatic MBA, which stands for what? Mega bank account money. Are you with me? So we don't want to do a thing. We want to do a what? Beautiful. Put it all together for Victor Antonio. Here we go. All right, there we go. I'm not here to mess around. You ready to learn? Yes or no? That's how it works in today's market. Whether it's B2B or B2C, you see the similar pattern. So how do you just, you know, in other words, say you've got to start doing these things, pushing them, but also encouraging them. Oh, look at this. This work is, dude, this is, this is like so interactive with audiences, Matt. Can you imagine this with your customers? Check this out. Now, what does all this have to do with selling? It has everything to do with selling. All right, welcome to another episode of Sales After Dark because money never sleeps. Now, if you're watching this on the replay, here's what I need you to do. 
Fast forward a few minutes here because I'm going to say hi to my friends and then I'll get into some content and then I'll do some Q&A towards the end. So anyway, today is episode 85, man. Can you believe that? 85, number 85. We're 15 away from hitting 100. Uh, most of you know already when I started this, I said I'm going to do 100 of these three times a week and it's been quite the challenge, but we're doing it, man. So today's topic is going to be good. I think you're going to like it. Let me put up the blank screen here so I can bring some comments online. And let me see who we got. Mia Knox, West Coast in the house. Mia, thank you for always joining, man. Appreciate you. And my man, Brian Gator. Salutations from Southern Nevada. Looking forward to another great session. Congrats on hitting 85. Thank you, Brian, man. You guys were really the center of attention this week, if you know what I mean. Uh, also, hey, Victor, uh, Pete Primo from Cleveland, Ohio, ready to learn, do your thing, always doing my thing. Ooh, Sparrow's tail is hanging out early here today, man. Way to go, man. Thank you for joining me. And then there's my man, Chris Stone, man. So again, if you like the intro, uh, I'm going to pop a video up in just a little bit that Chris edited for me, man. So uh, it, it's going to be cool, man. I love that little video we put together. I think you're going to like it as well. We got Todd Weinstein, man. Victor, you the man. Thank you very much. I can see you guys saying hi to each other, so I'll just skip that part. Willie Sanders, man, from Southside. Man, man, way to go, man. And this one is, oh, I'm going to need glasses for this one. All right. Shahela K. Baljit here. Excited to see you again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. What is that building? Is that the, is that in your avatar? Is that the Burj Khalifa? No, that's not the Burj Khalifa, is it? It, it kind of looks like it. Rahel Elbert from Jersey, man. Thank you. East Coast in the house. Fabiel Duran from Mexico. Guy sounds like a, a guy that does announcing the fights. And now, let's get ready, that guy. Anyway, so we got clear results. Dude, where you been? Clear results, man. Good evening, man. Tim Woods here from Highland Park, Illinois. Way to go, man. Again, you guys say hi to each other. That's cool. Vinay. Bannot, hello, Victor. Hello, right back at you. Uh, that's the University of Pittsburgh. All right, what are you studying at the University of Pittsburgh? Hello, Kohai. Uh -huh. You know what I'm talking about, man. So, uh, by the way, I watched. Kohai, do you like do you, do you like samurai films? Do you like? Let me hit, hit me back. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm just saying, do you like samurai films? I just watched one called Snow on the Blade. Snow on the Blade. It was one of the most well-made samurai movies i mean it's just beautiful classy movie man it's just oh love i love that love that culture uh bring the energy man michael but do my best brother but do my best uh listening from haiti great that you're here man thank you very much also good morning from india camless what man haiti and india yeah let's get everybody going cf what is happening what's new this week let me see cf what's coming new this week oh uh i'm about to close uh um uh, Let's just say a few deals. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to a few deals we're going to close this week. And I'm really excited to be working with some new companies. And so that's going to be really exciting. More to come on that. Mushtag Ahmed from Pakistan, man. Thank you for joining me, man. What time is it over there? Because I know it's got to be early, man. Pizzazzo View, good morning. Right back at you, man. Bruno Vincent, two first names from Thailand. Thank you for joining me, man. Uh, I think I missed somebody. Let me see. I think I got everybody. Anyway, let me just jump on this topic real quick because what I want to do is, um, so I want to show you, I'm going to do one video tonight. Chris, Chris cut up two for me, but I'm going to show you one because I really want to stay focused on one subject tonight. And I, I've told many of you that I'm doing the, the uh, my Sales Influence podcast. By the way, hit me with a one if you have subscribed to my Sales Influence podcast because what I started doing, I'm on episode... 11, I think 11, maybe 12 now. Uh, and what I started doing is interviewing frontline salespeople, some sales experts, but a lot of frontline salespeople. And some of the stuff I'm getting is just so, it's so real. It's so insightful. It's so like down to earth, like this is the stuff we need to know when we're selling, right? And sometimes it's not that it's something new. It's a, it's a reminder of something that we should have been doing or we already knew, but we forgot to do. And so some of these interviews are really powerful. And so the one I want to show you tonight, because uh, I want to stay focused on this one topic of, I think, the, one of the biggest mistakes sales leaders make. And I was interviewing Daniel Disney. 
Daniel Disney is, let's just call him Mr. LinkedIn Social Selling, that guy. He also has this uh, thing called the uh, the Daily Sales. And the Daily Sales, it's actually like, a, it's like almost like, it's not cartoons because it's actually, it takes a picture and it creates a meme out of it and it has everything to do with sales. It's some really funny stuff. And he is the founder of, you know, that uh, uh, company. And the number of follow-up, I, mean, I think it was like, he has like, I think he said like, I'm, I don't want to exaggerate, but I think maybe 700,000 followers who follow him on, on this. And so we got into this conversation and, you know, this is, this is a millennial man and I'm really loving talking to millennials. Millennials are cool. Uh, you know, baby boomer talking to millennials. It's a great conversation. So again, uh, if you haven't hit the Sales Influence Podcast, man, let me see if anybody... Give me a couple of ones here. So a lot of you guys hit. So again, the interviews, and give me feedback on the interviews. Leave them somewhere because I'd like to know whether you like, which ones you like, which ones you don't like. But again, I'm on episode 11 or 12. And so this week we released the Daniel Disney one. Uh, Dan Jordan, also the sales energizer, that's going to be uh, that's going to be released. What's well, released on audio, we'll, we'll get the video going soon. And then uh, a wonderful lady by the name of Meredith Elliott Powell. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about thriving on uncertainty. But back to Daniel Disney. Uh, I want to just show you this clip. It's going to be a short sales after dark tonight. I want to show you this clip. Uh, and again, thank you, Chris Stone, for putting this together for me. Uh, and I want to show you this clip, and then let's talk about it. It's, uh, it's, it's only like two minutes, two and a half minutes. But yeah, let me know what you think of this. Just listen in, and then let's talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I went through the same thing. You know, I, I was a young uh, VP of sales, had older people, and it was really hard, right? Because I think the you mentioned something that resonated with me was, where's that line? Uh, you know, sometimes I, I look at, I'll just call you the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And I go, you know, they, they seem to socialize too much, right? And it's like, where's that line where you're still respected, but I can still, it's always hard to find that line. Mm -hmm. And so you got to you got to manage that. And your guy, you're the person back at the office, still getting the work done, logging in the reports, trying to build out reports for your boss, and everybody else is partying. So you like caught in this this tween state. You got the boss to report, but you can't hang out down there, type of thing. And it's really hard, man. It's really hard. How did you, you know, what were some of the things you did to manage some of these salespeople that you kind of recall? Like, you know what, Victor, with certain salespeople, I did this and it seemed to work. With certain salespeople, I did that and that did not work. Anything? <laughs> give me something. Give me something. Give me something. I, give me I'm, something. I'm looking for some dirt here. Come <laughs> on, Dad. Give me some dirt, man. The, the best. <laughs> tip I can give and I remember the first day the first day uh, of being a sales leader and obviously I had the sales director supporting me sort of into this role and no training no sort of support prior to this this was day one okay on the floor let's see what are you going to do how are you going to react now before this I'd been told about one sales rep in particular who was trouble just the worst person Every, everybody has that one <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has that one. Anyone who's led them before, just constant hassle. The first thing I did, and again, there was no logic at the time behind this. This was just my gut instinct. First thing I did when I walked on that floor was I took that person to the side and I had a one-on-one -on -one chat. And I just leveled with them. I said, look, this is my first day. I want to make this this sort of you know shift as good as possible. I want us to both be successful. And I just spoke to them as a human being. I didn't sort of come down to them as a boss. I didn't sort of pivot myself higher than them. I just level with them. Look, we're both here. Um, you know, what can I do to make this good for you? How can we work well together? And honestly, it was one of the best shifts. And my director took me aside afterwards and said, never expected you to do that. But that's the first time we've seen this person perform like this before. So for me, it was that learning to listen to everyone individually and treat them as human beings. If you try and manage them, you're just going to get friction. Same with sales. If you try and sell to people, you're going to get friction. Just treat people <laughs> like human beings. It makes the whole thing a lot easier. Dude, I, I love that. I love that. Two things. I love what you just said. Uh, the first one is you dealt with the elephant in the room right away. Dude, let's talk real quick. Yeah. I know you're, I know you're a badass. I'm the new guy. I get it. I get it. <laughs> I can learn from you. Maybe you can learn from me. Can we try to work together? And the, per the other person probably felt a sense of respect. I would think like yeah. he acknowledged me. Because that's what people want, acknowledgement, right? Uh, and the thing is, when you try to manage people, I love the way you said that. When you manage people, you're going to get friction. you got to guide people. You can't manage them. And I think that's where the true managers come. Did you find it hard? There's like something called Polanyi's paradox is that you know it, but you can't explain it. Now, I won't go into that next part, but 
What, what I love about this video, and I, by the way, I'm, I'm gonna show the Dan Jordan one, I, cause I see him online, so I want him to see, cause we had this clip, I was gonna separate it for another, uh, I was gonna put it for the next night, but let me, I'll, I'll include that one. So Dan, I want you to hang in there. Uh, but on this one, what's interesting, if you really listen to what he was saying, it's really powerful because it's, how do you manage salespeople and what is the biggest mistake we often make? Let's go through some of the smaller mistakes, but then let's go for the big mistake. One of the smaller mistakes we make as leaders, and this is, this is always a tr tough one when you're transitioning, when, you know, if you remember the KD interview, he says, you got, you got to be so good that you basically outgrow your current position. So let's say you outgrow your sales position, now you become a manager or a leader. Well, you have to be, you have to act differently in a certain way. And by that I mean is that you can no longer afford some of the, the luxuries of being, for example, buddies with everybody because now you're their boss. And I think that's one, that's one mistake that he highlighted, that Daniel highlighted, that I know that a lot of people, you know, it's a trap that people fall into. And so they, they forget that there's a line. You know, above them, they got people that they have to report to, but now they have the people that they used to work with are now people that report to them. And we want to try to have the same relationship, but in all honesty, you can't. So I think that was one of the bi biggest things uh, that I loved about what he said is that we have to kind of figure out what that line is. The second was that as young salespeople, young sales leaders, or even just the average sales leader, sometimes when you're walking into a situation, you have to really deal with the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is that one person, and everybody, we all have that one person that just, you know, just goes too left, too far right, and you're like trying to bring them back to center. And I, I love the fact that he was very direct taking the person to the side and saying, let's have this one-on-one. -on -one. Let's deal with this. In other words, acknowledging the elephant in the room and showing that person, this is the third part, a sense of respect. Because sometimes that's what people want. When a new person comes in, right, you're the new person, you're the new manager, you're the new leader, you're the new VP. What the salesperson who's been there and maybe didn't get the job or has been there, has been putting in the work, making the number, when a new VP comes in or new leader comes in, all they want is for you to acknowledge their, you know, accomplishments. In other words, let them know that you know that they're good and that it'll diffuse that situation. And then, but the biggest mistake, the biggest mistake that sales leaders make when they come into a position of managing salespeople is they try to manage them. You can't, there's certain people you just can't manage. And it's usually the best salespeople that we have that we can't manage. And so that's why, you know, that we were talking about that little emphasis that you don't want to manage people. As Daniel says, it just creates too much friction. You want to find a way to guide them and handle them. And I think that's the hat trick, right? That's the trick right there. How do you balance that? How do you kind of move them forward, but at the same time, not manage them? And so to me, the biggest mistake is, I really, I guess there should be two. One is, we got to realize that now that we're in a position of authority, if you're a manager or a VP, director, doesn't matter, you can no longer be, and I'm not saying you can't be friends with the people that you, you know, you're, you're, you're managing, but the relationships change. And number two, again, don't manage, just guide them. And so I wanted to show you that because that's what, that's the type of stuff we're getting from the, uh, the Sales Influence podcast. And I see some of your comments on these that, that some of you have actually watched them. Now, I wasn't going to show this one, but I'm going to show this one. I'm going to show the Deej one. Uh, it's a different topic. That's why I was debating whether, because I didn't want to do two topics tonight. But what the hell? Let's go. Let's go with this one. So this second clip that Chris Stone put together for me, uh, this is my interview with uh, my man Dan Jordan, aka the Sales Energizer, aka the DJ, aka DJ, aka the Sales Arbiter. Dude, you got too many names. But anyway, Dan Jordan. Uh, it's really interesting because when I, when I was interviewing Dan, now I've known Dan for about a year, maybe two. But we've had what I'll call that a casual relationship. We just know each other. Hey, what's up? You know, uh, we met one time uh, personally. And what was interesting is that in this interview, you know, he's telling me things that I didn't know about him. And I thought they were very fascinating. But I want to show you the video first because even I'm going, oh, I didn't know that about you. Oh, I didn't know that about you. But this, I'm going to put this under the category of sometimes what you see isn't always what's really there. There's really more to a person. And so I want you to watch this because I think, you know, uh, just watch the video. Just well, the big, the big money maker for all the kids was, uh, it was shoveling snow. Hmm. Like that was a big deal. Like anytime it snowed, we were all excited because A, no school, but B, you know, everybody just grabbed their shovel. And it was like the weirdest thing, how it happens real quickly where people start like picking their areas. And uh, that was a time when I learned it, wake up early 
Yeah. No matter what you do, wake when you wake up early, you get to pick the houses that you want to go to. Yeah. Instead of getting the, the leftovers of everybody else. You were, and the way, trick is you want to get you want to get the houses that when the sun rises it melts the snow on the driveway mm -hmm. because otherwise you could you know you do it and it looks like like garbage. And people, why can't you make it look like that? So. Now, now see, there, there's a lot of sales lessons embedded in this simple story, right? <laughs> One, right. get up early. Two, territory management. Three, yeah. ideal client profile, right? So this, that's this, right this is all sales in the back of your head it's, going hey this is how you do it man you make it better yeah every, everybody wanted the samuels house that's right samuels that's had right. a good house they had a big house and it had a, a walkway but a very short sidewalk area so was sidewalk easy. always yeah the big accounts <laughs> those, those are called the key accounts you love key accounts so that's how, right how did you train now, now let me pause that. i'm gonna come back to dan in just a bit because there's a second part to the story but what's interesting is that you know when you hear somebody tell a story like that like dan was telling me the story and i'm saying well that's sales like many people who, you know, I talk to are say, Victor, I'm, I'm not good at selling. And then when they tell you a story like this, and by the way, I'm not talking about Dan in this case. I'm talking about people who always say, I'm not in sales. I've never sold before. If you really think about it, if you really look at your childhood, you really go back. There was a lot of times you were selling and you didn't know it. In this case, what I thought was interesting about the story was that he's talking about, you know, finding the right house to shovel because that's pretty a, a good client and find, you know, wherever the sun rises, you want to get those driveways because those driveways are easier to do. Well, that's sales, right? That's territory management. That's finding the ideal client profile. That's also finding uh, low-hanging fruit. Remember, low-hanging fruit is easy deals, right? So all this is sales. So there's so many things that we do that's all about sales, and we often forget that everything we've done. Up to this point, if you really search your database of experience, you've been in sales for a very long time. Now, let me continue with this interview because he, because then Dan goes a little deep and I have, like for me, it was like an aha moment. So here, let me go back in and I'll fast forward a little bit. Hold on one second. Let me just do this. And I thought this was really interesting. This was really- Well, the big the big money maker for all the sidewalk area. So was Sidewalk easy. always, yeah. The <laughs> big accounts. Those, those are called the key accounts. You love key accounts. So That's how, right. How did you transition from, you know, you know, selling gym shoes and cleaning sidewalks to like, you know, what was your transition into the world of selling, man? Oh, well, you know, it, it, it wasn't sales at the beginning. It was business ownership. And I think that's where that's where we are right now. There's different different times in history and different kind of revolutions, you know, uh, uh, you know, the industrial revolution and the, the computer revolution. But right now we're in kind of this real gig economy. Everybody's a self-employed. Even if you're a salesperson, you, if you consider yourself self-employed, you have a much better chance. And so my goal was always to own my own business. And so my my first business was a uh, uh, I I took my college money and uh, before my parents knew it hit them and I bought a butcher shop like in the next town over in Elmer really? Park. Yeah. And um, turned it into a deli, DJ's Country Deli. And that was my first business. And, uh, you know, it was college money. So it, people say, oh, that's a big risk. Man, you, you have nothing if you, you, you got this thing. And so. Uh, if I lost it, big deal. You know, you can't lose something that you don't have. And so, but I worked my brains out. My first year, I worked 365 days in a row because that's how many days there were that year. And uh, the next year, I worked 363 days because Christmas and New Year's was on a uh, was on a Sunday that year. So I said, eh, I'll take a day off. And so we did that. Um, but I learned very quickly in that deli that you could wait for people to come in and you could you, know, you could sell them your buttered rolls and coffee or you could sell this thing called catering and then the sky's the limit mm. and so my first entrance into outside sales was was selling catering for that deli and very quickly i realized that's that's where the money it's outside you just got to ask for it because yeah. anybody will try you once how long did you own the business how long did you own that business I owned that business for uh, for seven years. I sold it when I was 25. Good story. You want to hear a good story? I'll leave it right there so you can listen to the podcast of the good story. Well, what's interesting in talking to Dan in that story, in that interview was that before that, we talked about how he was selling gym shoes. Then he went to selling, again, his sidewalk services, shoveling during the winter. And then the deli business, right? So at deli, uh, he sold it at 25, had it for seven years. Uh, I think he gave me how much he sold it for, which was pretty impressive by itself, but he had it for seven years. How many people do you know at the age of 18 can open up a deli? 
right? I mean, how many people do you know at 18 can open up their own deli and sell it in seven years? In fact, most businesses go out in what, less than five years. So he ma managed to maintain that. And so it was a great conversation. And one of the things I asked Dan to do is that in the future, as he talks about sales, is to use a lot of these personal experiences because all this is what people want from you. So with this video, what I would emphasize, what I want to highlight here is that many of you have some great experiences, right? That, you know, things you've been through that maybe you don't value as much as other people. And as soon as you start telling these stories, you, other people will listen to them and go, oh, I didn't know you did that. Wow, you have that experience. Wow, that's great. And so when I'm listening to Dan, I'm going, why aren't you talking about more of what you used to do? Of all these past experiences, especially on the deli side, for example, of what you used to do, because that's what people want to hear. They want to hear the, the ups and downs, right? They want to hear what you went through because that experience is super valuable. And, I, you know, I walked away from that interview and, and we talked afterwards. And one of the things I told him was, I said, I said, you need to let people know that you, you're just not just the guy who talks about sales and, you know, motivating people, but that you actually have some real business experience. Gym shoes, sidewalks, and a deli and still growing his business. And today he consults with a lot of small companies. So check him out, danjordan.com, and then check out Daniel Disney as well, Matt. Like I said, two great interviews, and I just wanted to share that with you tonight. I thought it was interesting, but I want to emphasize for the Daniel Disney, the biggest mistake is try to manage people instead of guiding them. I think that's a big one. And uh, for Dan Jordan, man, that interview, it was almost like, wow, there's so much that you have to offer, you need to let that shine a little more. Let people see that side of you. And so, like I said, if you have some experience and you're holding back because you think, eh, nobody's going to think this is important, you won't know until you put it out there. So that's all I had to talk about tonight. I want to check out, there's a lot of comments here, so let me make sure I get some of these. Uh, cup of tea's in the house. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Jordan's interview was great also. I agree with you, Matt, as well. Podcast with Frank Bisgatis. Man, I, I enjoyed that one. Uh, the buyer-centric selling one. Yeah, haven't seen that one. TJ, go check it out. Uh, you're saying the biggest mistake to me, mis uh, mistake sales leaders make is that they don't know they're making mistakes. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a paradox. Uh, you got to see it, TJ. Uh, Dan was awesome. Will do. Uh, got my man, Doug Lehman, breaking it down. Lehman, sir. Coming attractions of more interviews in the episode, Matt. Yeah, good stuff coming our way. Uh, uh, apparently, Brian Gator is unmanageable. That's understandable. Uh, I just got Dan Jordan's book. Uh, by the way, it's Jordan. It's J-O-U-R-D-A-N. He has a weird spelling, man, right? So Dan Jordan's book, uh, Sales Proverbs, I could not put it down. It's not a how-to sales book, all right? I have not read it, so uh, thank you very much, man. It was a good interview. Oh, my man, clear results. What do you got? Uh, when promoted to a position of higher responsibility, inform your direct reports that you are not changing who you are, but, that, but all the new position means is that you have more responsibility. I agree. You don't want to change who you are. And I, that's why I was trying to be careful with that. That you don't want to, it's not just saying, okay, I'm different now. I, I got, you know, I'm wearing a tie, so to speak. I'm different. Treat me differently. Is that you have to remind them. I think you, that's so well articulated that you just tell them, look, I just have new responsibilities, which means, and I think people get that. And I think if people don't understand it, that's an issue. But I think if you really talk through the people, I think you're 100% on the money, man. Just tell people. When people start behaving differently is when problems with character inauthenticity creeps in. Leading people from being true to self makes the transition so much easier. All you got to do is stay true to yourself. But I love the first part, which is also let people know my responsibility has changed. I hope you understand that. But I'm still the same person. I just have responsibilities. And now... You know, there's going to be some things that you have to do and so forth and so on. And I think it goes back to what Daniel Disney said. If you feel like you have a problem with somebody, go directly. And notice he said he took him to the side, did a one-on-one, -on -one, and just had that conversation. Uh, true story. I mean, t today I had a friend of mine call me, a really good friend, and he was, you know, in the dumps because his manager you know, there's theory Y and theory X. Theory X is command control. Theory Y is delegation. Well, this guy has like, I don't know, theory B, I call it, because all he does is call my friend up and it's just berating or bullying. In other words, there's no guidance. It's just like, you know, more, work faster, get more done, work faster. And that's horrible management, man. And so I, yeah, my heart goes out to him. Sales arbitration, art month too. I don't know what that means, but thank you for joining us, man. Uh, how do you differentiate the role of a business manager and a sales manager? What a good, what a good question. So to me, I'm giving you my perspective. So because when I look at a business manager, they're more concerned with 
beyond sales, they're looking at the operations of it also, right? So it's, uh, and I'm not talking about a business development, you know, uh, person. I'm talking about a business manager where you're looking at all aspects that include sales, marketing, and maybe even the operations of the actual facility. So to me, that's what a business manager is. Now, another definition of a business manager is that you want to open up new markets and new territories. And then that person, that's their sole focus. That's kind of a business manager development. And we're a salesperson, sales manager, strictly just sales. That's how I would draw the line. Let me know if you agree, Vinay, or how you would spin it differently. But if I'm looking at, if, if I'm business manager, I'm either looking at the full operation, almost like a general manager, right? Or business manager could also be, again, finding new markets, new territories, or maybe developing new products for new markets and new territories. But then the sales managers, man, we got accounts, we laid out accounts. I've also seen business managers defined as they have a portfolio of key accounts, key accounts being very large accounts. Uh, so for example, let's just say I'm, I'm talking out loud here that there's companies that you have two or three big companies that have uh, over $10 million a year in revenue with your company. Uh, well, to actually service that type of company, you need about four or five people. So as a business manager, you now manage that business, that account, and you have four or five people who just service that account. So that's another way of looking at it. So there's many ways you can slice this pie, but I'd love to hear your input. Uh, let me see. Kenry, what's happening? Ready to learn something new from BA? Hope that you are doing okay. I'm doing better than okay. Kenry, I hope you're doing as well, man. Uh, Master VA. Did you get the video already? Sent it in three parts. I did get it. I haven't looked at it. Thank you very much. And let me let me see. I'm going to send it to Chris and uh, maybe we'll do something with it. Okay. Uh, coming in late, but glad to be catching you live. Cheryl, glad you're here, man. Thank you. And then you can always catch it on the replay. You know how that goes. How to become sales engineer AE from a software engineer role. Kevin. So, Kevin, you're speaking my language because I started as a sales engineer. I started out as an engineer. Then I moved into application engineer. People always ask me, what's the difference? Well, when I was a, a software engineer or hardware engineer, you know, you work either with software or hardware. It's very specific, right? There's something you're working on. When you move into applications engineer, it's almost like zooming out. Now you're putting boxes together. The best way to describe it is that if I'm a software or component engineer, I talk about building maybe one of these, right? So let's go remote control, right? One of these. But... If I'm an application engineer, it could be a software application, or maybe I now combine multiple things, make them talk to each other, and create systems, and that was what I defined as an application engineer. And then uh, I would travel with salespeople. And what I learned, Kevin, is uh, salespeople always lead the dance, right? And I learned my role. The reason people liked taking me along was that I knew, my, I knew, I knew how to stay in my lane. In other words, I knew to talk about engineering up to the point just to support the salesperson. And when the customer was talking about money or contracts, I would just shut up. And so uh, that was my role as an application slash sales engineer. And by the way, we were also given a quota associated with the salesperson. So we had actual quota. So in that case, we were actually sales engineers. And I think the transition uh, to become your own uh, <laughs> Uh, applica uh, account executive and AE was that, you know, it's funny how when you're traveling with salespeople, and you've probably had this where you're traveling with salespeople or, or, you know, you're supporting salespeople and you think it's easy until you have to do it yourself. And when you have to do it yourself as an account executive, that's when the big aha moments hit. That's when you really kind of figure out like, oh man, this is not as easy as I thought. So, you know, it's funny because when you're on the engineering side, you say salespeople don't do anything. Then when you get on the sales side, you're like, oh, I get it. And so the transition for me was easier because I had a great mentor. And I, I've talked about Jose Santana in the past. And this guy, I would just travel with him. He was a sales guy. I was the engineer. And I would just watch him. And the way he treated his customers, like, you know, with kid gloves, it was the most amazing thing to see. And I, I think I, I got so much from that, Kevin, that I realized that what customers want is for you to care about them. I know you know this already. It's just a reminder. And that you don't have to be slick right? You don't have to be clever. You just have to care about them and look out for their best interests. If you can do that, man, you'll cruise in the sales very easily. It's not that hard if you have your customer's best interests in mind. And I know people hear this all the time, but executing and staying within that philosophy lane is where the best salespeople are, man. So I don't know if that helps, but I had a great mentor and you know how you just watch somebody do things and then you go, okay, that's how you do it. 
That's how you build rapport. That's how you connect. That's how you do a presentation. And I learned all the things like how to do a presentation, make it succinct, when to stop, ask questions, what type of questions, when to do demos, how to do demos. And I, I got lucky, man. I got lucky. I got a great one, man. I got a great manager. So great question, man. Uh, how to become a sales engineer or AE from a software engineer? Like I said, I got that one. So hopefully I've answered that question, Kevin. Let me know if uh, you need more elaboration. LOL, Yoruichi. Hi, what's your opinion of giving personnel sales as a sales leader to a new recruit? My director asked me to do that for many exceptions to help new sales reps believe in the job. I don't know if I understand that one. Let me see. What's your opinion on giving personal sales as a sales leader to a new recruit? My director asked me to do that for many exceptions to help new sales people. In other words, uh, giving personal sales advice, I'm gonna take it, that's it. If you're giving personal sales advice uh, as a sales leader, I mean, that's part of the coaching. You know, I, I think that's what you mean. Should, should our job as sales leaders be coaching? Absolutely. That's part of our gig, right? We have to be coaches. Uh, so I don't know if that's what you mean. Uh, uh, let me see. My director asked me to do that. Many exceptions to help new sales reps believe in their job. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, just like I, I was mentioning to Kevin, is that I had a mentor, uh, you know, who would just tell me when I was doing something right or I was doing something wrong as a salesperson. And so... I would have moments where, you know, he would take me off to the side. He said, you know, after, after we did a call together, so he's a sales guy, I'm the engineer. After we did a call together, he would actually say, yeah, I remember getting in the car and he said, all right, here's what you did right, here's what you did wrong. And I remember early on, it was really painful to hear, you know, the feedback because you kind of think, I thought I did well. And then he says, here's a couple of things. You sh don't say this, do this, always look at me, show this, don't do that. And... And then after a while, you got the rhythm. And what happened was is that more people started wanting to bring me along because they realized I was a good sales engineer that would actually support the salespeople. So I don't know if I helped you, but I hope I did. Uh, how do you respond to this one? Masvia, I don't have the selling skills. Uh, when somebody tells me that, I'm not buying because they've always, you know, everybody's always sold. You know, I, I always joke with people. I said, you know, uh, when, you're, when you were born as a baby, you started crying, right? That was your first sales pitch. That was your first sales pitch. You were you were trying to sell your mother on the idea that you were hungry, right? And as you got older, you started, you know, again, you started begging, right? You know, mommy, can I have a cookie? And you would do it with a soft voice. I mean, that's that's selling, right? You're selling your mother on the idea that she should give you a cookie. As you got older, you became a teenager. And then you're like, hey, mom, if uh, dad, if I clean my room, get my homework done, and I get good grades, can I use the car this weekend? Well, that's called bartering or bargaining, right? That's selling too. It's all selling. So everybody. So when somebody says they don't have sales skills, uh, here, I'll give you the perfect line. When somebody says, I don't have selling skills, just say this. You ready? To, just say this. You're selling me right now. You know what you're selling me on? That you don't have sales skills. That's what you say. That's how you close that one. Because when somebody tells you I don't have sales skills, they're selling you on the idea that they don't have sales. So they're actually selling you. So think about it that way. And you got them. How's that? Unfortunately, many sales managers are promoted. Salespeople are promoted salespeople. Being great at sales does not always equate to being great at management, which creates a lose-lose. More training needed for both. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the Peter principle when you're promoted to the point of incompetency. Let me say that again because most people don't understand that phrase. The Peter principle, it says there are people who are promoted to the point of incompetency. And that is they're promoted, but they really don't have the skill sets. So, Brian, you, you're 100% right that just because you're a great salesperson doesn't make you a great sales manager. And, you know, that's a mistake we make. We often take our best salesperson off the field, make them a manager, and they don't know how to actually train. Uh, in that video with Daniel Disney, I cut, it, I cut it off when I got into, what you know, a Polanyi's paradox. And Polanyi's paradox basically says the following. Polanyi's paradox, by the way, it's spelled, uh, if you want to look it up. It's Polanyi. I don't know what that is up there. It's called Polanyi's Paradox. And Polanyi's Paradox basically says is that you know it, but you can't explain it. You ever run into people like that? There's people I know. There's great salespeople. I know just great salespeople. And then you ask them, how do you sell? They're like, and they can't articulate. These, there's great salespeople, but then you move them into management roles. And then when a salesperson comes to that manager says, hey, how did you do it? How did you sell that well? 
the sales manager can't explain it. He can't articulate. He just says, well, go out there and just sell, just make a lot of calls. That's not going to help. And that's Polanyi's paradox. So it's always interesting because it's, uh, you know, a lot of people are, just shouldn't be in management in a row. So it's always a trick. Uh, uh, TJ got my joke. Yeah, that's right. Because again, once they say I'm not selling, well, you're selling me now on the idea that you're not selling. You can't sell. Uh, True Gator, different temper may also be required. You got it. Blip news, you're back. What's happening? I just got promoted recently to a corporate sales manager role, and the company is flying me out of the country, uh, flying me out across the country for a sales manager meetup. Got any advice? Thanks again for all your help. Uh, find out what the best of the best do. You're going to meet some great sales managers. Figure out who they are, and just ask them. What do you do? How did you become so great? Again, uh, this is the perfect time to humble yourself and just learn from people and just ask a lot of questions. Remember, the best time to ask questions, I always believe, is within the first 30 days of getting any new position. If you're still asking dumb question after 30 days, that's never good, okay? So now's the time for the next 30 days. I want you to ask every question you think. There is no stupid question, but if you think it's stupid, just ask it because after 30 days, it's unforgivable. That's my rule, by the way. I made that up, that after 30 days, you can't ask stupid questions. So just for 30 days straight, ask as many as you want. Uh, Pete says, blip, listen, listen, listen. There you go. BZ Baseball, what is this? BZ Baseball, we're having a conversation about Moneyball. Uh, but thank you for joining me. Uh, please tell me about the football behind you above to your right. So you want to know about that football right there. You know, that was given to me by, ah, oh, what's the guy? Uh, and I forgot his second, last name. By the way, help me out. Uh, because I, I just pulled this out because I was like looking at stuff to put on this shelf, you know. And so, uh, what's this? He's on ESPN. His name is Herb. Last name begins with an E. Who knows who I'm talking about? But he signed this football for me uh, like three or four years ago. And he has a saying called, you play to win the game. And he signed that for me. He's on ESPN. I can't think of his last name. Herb? Oh, something like that. Thank you for putting me on the spot, Chris Stone, man. Now I can't remember who the guy is. Uh, if you know who he is, let me know. Uh, let me ask. Uh, they asked me to prepare appointments and give the first few sales to the new guy. Oh, they asked you to prepare the appointment and give the first few sales? That is so wrong. That is so wrong. Uh, that is so wrong. By the way, I mean, if you have a boss that's saying this to you, I mean, I mean, that's just wrong. I mean, does anybody agree with this? Uh, Herb Edwards. Herm Edwards. Thank you, Doug Lehman. I knew Doug would know this. Herm Edwards. Thank you, man. Uh, we did a speech together, by the way, Doug Lehman, Herm Edwards and I, about four years ago, and he gave me the football. He signed it for me. Cool, very cool dude. Uh, I don't know what to say about this. They, they asked me to prepare appointments. In other words, make the appointment and then give them the first few sales, give the first few sales to the new guy. And so I think what they're trying to do is, is they're trying to give the salesperson momentum, Right. And so if you're a sales leader, let me see if I can answer this question another way. If you're a sales leader and you got new salespeople, one of the first things you want to do is try to get them to success as quick as possible. A, a success is get them their first appointment as soon as possible. Get their first sales as soon as possible. I wouldn't say give them the sale. You know, so what I would do is find a way for you to accelerate his win rate. By that, I mean, you know, his or her win rate. So in other words, I don't know if I'd give them the sales. I, I would sit next to them and said, help them make the appointments. Or, I mean, I might even go as far as, I'm going to help you make an appointment. You're going to do the presentation, and I'm going to go with you, and we're going to close the deal together. That's what I would do. I would coach them through that. But I wouldn't just say, hey, I just closed this deal. You can have it. That's wrong. That, that, it doesn't help the person. It doesn't help the person. So you can help them make the appointment. I believe in that. You can help them close the deal. I believe in that if you're a sales leader. But to give somebody an appointment, to give somebody, a, maybe I'll give somebody an appointment, maybe, but to give them my sale, no. I would support them in the sale. I mean, based on what you said, I would just, that's just, it sounds a little crazy. Uh, cool. All right. As always, thank you. Raga Senga. Thank you for joining us, Matt. Doug Lehman, thank you for that. Herm Edwards, that's his name. Uh, you're right, Victor, 100% wrong. You're right, Victor, 100% wrong. Yeah, to give him that, yeah. So, and that's, yeah, that's awesome. 
Uh, they need their own success. I mean, no, they need their own success. I mean, you can't do it for them. And Gator here says, no, no, if you do the work, you should get the credit, period, stop, that's it. So any manager that says give away your sale, uh, I, don't believe, I don't believe you should do that. So anyway, I'm going to wrap up here real quick. Uh, I just want to remind you, if you by the way, so hit the subscribe like button below. Just do that. Hit the subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, hit that button so you get the little bell notification. If you like this video, The Sales After Dark, make sure you hit the like. But more importantly, you know what the price of this is. It's free, but there is one small price. Just share it with at least one other person so we can grow the community. And I'm really happy about where this is episode 85. You know, from those for those of you, and I know who you are, you've been from with me from the beginning. Uh, M.I. says, uh, let me see on this one. Learned much from you. Took 10 years and personally patented oil industry changes tech with your guidelines. Seventh largest oil producer governments are convinced. I don't know. I don't know what all that is, but man, it sounds like great news. And if you're making money, I love that. Uh, you're welcome on the feedback. Never give it away, man. Okay, is, is it Herb? See, I had, see, this is what was confusing. I had Herb Edwards in my head. You sure is Herb Edwards. So now I'm confused. Okay, so it's one of the two. I thought it was Herb. Uh, but now stuck, I'm a chemical engineer. Uh, get the Sales Velocity Academy. Again, check out salesvelocityacademy.com. But more importantly, uh, you know, check out the Sales Influence Podcast. You can find it anywhere. So whether it's Apple, Stitcher, uh, any just YouTube, wherever you'll find it, uh, wherever you listen to your podcast, there you go. Uh, good content, good stuff. And on that note, I hope you learned something. Like I said, the, the one big takeaway is, again, when you're managing people, don't manage them, so to speak. Guide them. Help them out. Uh, and that was the Daniel Disney video. When it comes to like really sharing your knowledge of what you know, that was the Dan Jordan video. When it comes to sharing your knowledge with the people you know, let it out sometime. Let people know your experiences. Like that story that Dan told about the, the shoveling the snow, there were so many small lessons in there. And I'm not saying that you'd say that, you know, during a sales presentation, but these are the things that, you know, even small stories like that connect with people. These are stories that I would use. I wish I had that story. I wish I had the shoveling snow story like Dan had because I would use that story to connect with people, to let them know, hey, I'm just like you. I started shoveling snow or doing some simple jobs. And then one day at the age of 18, I owned my own deli, which is amazing. It's just a mind blower that Dan had a business for seven years. Incredible. On that note, I am out of here. This is Victor Antonio, always reminding you, selling ain't hard when you know how. Take care. We'll see you.